yeah, thank you very much for the very kind introduction. And um, you've already heard kind of the important things to know about myself, that I am originally from the rural region. I grew up in a coal mining family, so I do relate to this. I think it's important for people to know um, that this is something that uh, um, has informed my research. And also, um, I am an energy historian, but um, I'm working in a very large project together with deindustrialization scholars. So it's a seven-year project on deindustrialization and the politics of our time. So what I'm doing today is kind of a first thing piece. I just arrived about two weeks ago. I have three months, and I'm really looking forward to all the scholarly exchange that I will have. Um, I'm also based at um, the Project House Europe, so I'm not going to talk about the European dimension of my topic, but of what I think is something that is maybe relevant for environmental historians. So this is a thing piece that tries to establish what an energy historian has to contribute to those discussions on deindustrialization. So, um, Strukturwandel, very often people have very specific images in mind, uh, something like this. If you've ever been to the rural region, we're very good at you know, making money out of this uh, in, in all sorts of ways. Um, and the interesting thing about Strukturwandel or structural change, which um, in the English, in our group, is translated as deindustrialization, but you already see the problem that we have here. Um, in the English language, there's a, a very, um, very much an emphasis on moving from industrialization to deindustrialization or post-industrial society. In the German context, it's actually a lot easier to insert yourself as an energy historian because the idea of structural change is at the heart of what we study when we study energy transitions. And um, so this is something where it already is very useful to sort of come in from a different language, those of you who speak different languages than uh, English or in the Canadian context, French. These are already very good starting points for some of these discussions. Do note, however, how a lot of these images are devoid of people. And so kind of the subtext of what I'm talking about is where are the people? Now, in terms of energy transition, I find something very similar. If you're Googling images of energy transition, very often you will find all sorts of uh, iterations of very similar uh, images, um, very often, again, devoid of people. And um, that is something that we like to address in our larger project, but also something that I would like to talk as an energy historian about, and those of you who study energy transitions, and I know there's some here in the room, know that this is not new, but the emphasis on the fact that energy transitions are always also social and cultural transitions is something that hasn't seemed to have arrived yet everywhere in our discussions on this. So what we really need to address is why do we still have too many images that are actually devoid of people? Now, I've used these two to also show something else, and that is the top one is um, taken out of a Southern European uh, research uh, um, focus, and it's very much focusing on coal production. So you already see the difference between what you would see maybe in my province in Alberta, which has, you know, in terms of... Uh, um, material uh, expressions of uh, energy, not much to offer except from oil derricks. But in the case of coal mining, you actually have something that deindustrialization scholars are very familiar with, and that is factories uh, that can become ruins, that are uh, um, power stations that can become ruins. So we already see also um, why I'm particularly interested in studying deindustrialization in coal mining, because that is a particular deindustrialization that renders itself maybe better for start being studied as an energy transition. So I'm not making an argument here to say all of deindustrialization needs to be reconsidered as energy transition. What I'm proposing is at the heart of deindustrialization is a lot of studies on coal mining. And we are losing some of the interesting insights because we're not studying them equally as energy transition within this. Um, 
because, and this is kind of the reason why I'm doing this, and this is where historians for once can insert themselves in current discussions, we have in Europe, as we have in my home province of Alberta, a lot of discussions about those left behind. So current discussions on just transition is not only looking at how marginalized people are um, more affected by climate change than others, but equally, and this is if you come out of regions that rely on oil, gas, or coal industries, it's equally about what happens to people who have jobs in those industries. And so this is a, a European initiative, and as you can see here, this is about the socioeconomic uh, impact of the transition, but more importantly for me is the idea that um, we must show solidarity with the most affected regions in Europe, such as coal mining regions. And of course, the underlining fear here is that of populism. The idea that if we look at Brexit, if we look at Trump, if we look at uh, France, Le Pen, if we look at a lot of it actually happens in those regions that used to be coal and steel. And um, this is how, sort of where some of the European uh, um, policies are really trying to address. So a very different just transition than some of you might think about in terms of the energy um, transition here. So this is something where historians revisiting some of the earlier transitions might be able, and I'm not someone who, who talks about lessons learned and you know history repeating, but what I'm saying is you need to understand the complexity and the nuances of any energy transition. Assuming that certain things can simply be done is something that we need to deconstruct based on the kind of insights that we can give there. And so coming back then to this idea, if energy transitions are about social change, then where are the people in those discussions on energy transition and deindustrialization? Now, you may say that both in deindustrialization and energy history, we have a lot of talk about people. I would argue, though, a lot of that is around organized labor. So if you look at deindustrialization, a lot of it is labor history. A lot of it is about unionized labor. A lot of it is really anchored in the workplace, which is just the power plant, which is the coal mine, which is the steel plant. As an energy historian, what you, ha what you would say to this, though, is, but what about everything around it? What about this idea of coal country? in, for example, Appalachia? What is the idea of you know, an entire energy scape that goes well beyond the actual workplace? So the idea here is that not only those who are working and who are paid for working and those who are organized are those that we should study, but everyone who's connected to it. So the anthropologists will probably talk about um, the sense of place that is related to these kind of regions. And we are, we are making this particular point, which sounds really obvious, but if you look at how we have studied deindustrialization, for example, we kept out those women who were not working. As an energy historian, you can add to that that it is women who are equally part of the energy production process, because without women at home, doing all sorts of work, there wouldn't be that energy production. And so this is where um, the idea here is to go beyond just the traces of work and go down to the people. Because very often, we do not hear about these people who are integral to those deindustrialized spaces or post-industrial spaces like women, like non-unionized workers, marginalized groups. So the idea here of deindustrialization as energy transition is to understand historical processes of deindustrialization in energy industries as energy transition because that helps us decenter the lived experience of deindustrialization beyond unionized white male workers. And that is something that is still uh, needed, and equally, only if we understand this in a regional 
and, if you will, energy system context, we can then also engage in discussions about what happens if that new energy transition is really going to happen. So not just thinking about the new jobs that are there. Secondly, this reframing may also facilitate important historical interventions by historians than in current discussions. So what happens if we go down? If I say, where are the people? I'm interested in energy transitions as lived experience. Now, this is where it is so fascinating to use Strukturwandel as a case study, because Strukturwandel is what would be considered a minor energy transition within the large energy transition from an organic to a mineral regime, where you move from biofuels, biomass, and all that, into uh, the hydrocarbons uh, and, and coal. But this is just, if you will, a transition from coal to oil. However, this is much more fascinating because this is one that happens during people's lifetime. So we can actually try and understand how do, act, how do people, if we, if we think that energy transitions are social transitions, well, how do people actually create narratives around this? How do they make sense of, of that experience? Do they even make sense of it? One of the biggest things that we find in the oral history sources is that at the time of what in retrospect, we see as transition, most people don't realize right, that they're going through this transition. So for the Ruhrgebiet, the most important thing is that in the late 1950s, when the energy transition starts, most people don't consider it a cyclical change, not a structural change. It is just something that will rebound. And so um, what we are able to do then is to really find a lived experience of an energy transition. And it is particularly valid to do this for the Ruhrgebiet because we already have a lot of oral histories that were collected as part of deindustrialization studies. So this is why uh, I'm particularly interested in this. A reminder, of course, what do we do with this lived experience? I mean, it, it's not representative, it can be very um, specific and individual, but the idea here is that while individual behavior itself, of course, is influenced by existing and durable historical systems, including energy systems, it is through everyday acts where that these meanings are reinforced but also rejected, which may cause change in the long run. So change can only be understood by looking at all levels of human behavior and through acknowledging the connections between, between larger historical shifts and everyday actions. I have focused in on women and really interesting observations in terms of how women of coal miners are actually actively being involved in the energy transition because their everyday choices in the household everywhere is a direct impact in terms of choosing certain energy forms, which sometimes is obvious, most often it is not. So it really reminds us of the ambivalence of human choices in an energy system that is transitioning. Um, very quickly, um, because I know we, ha well, it's, we have to sort of uh, limit it to 25 minutes, when I talk about energy transitions, I just wanted to make sure that we're all aware of the big transition that you can see here that I mentioned from essentially biomass to coal, but then very quickly, as you can see, to hydrocarbons and oil. And that's kind of the transition that I'm talking about. But do not be confused. These are percentages. So these are actually percentages of the overall energy mix. What happens at the same time is that coal production doesn't decline in the world. It is just that at the same time, we also have the arrival of high energy societies, right? What McNeil has termed the great acceleration. So this is one of the um, things about energy transition. However, in Germany, what we see is a massive decline in hard coal production, and even more massive decline, a halving of miners in those jobs. This is significant because those of you are familiar with West German history, um, the idea is, of course, that the, the German economic miracle is pretty much fueled by coal mining. And that is what is going down there. But more importantly, and this is, uh, if you're interested, Odin Melstad has made a really, really good case about this, is on the one hand, we, you see here 
this massive change between 1960 and 1972. This is household use for heating purposes of coal in West Germany. And this is going from 84% coal to 32% coal. This is, of course, individual choices about household heating. And by the way, this is very pronounced in the rural region itself. So people who lived in the rural region made very specific decisions about the heating. And those of you who are familiar with coal versus oil know it is a lot cheaper, a lot cleaner to actually use oil for heating than coal. But a lot of these people were doing this while at the same time protesting the closing of mines. And so this is a really interesting case study in terms of understanding um, the ambivalences and ambiguities of individual choice during energy transitions. So a lot of these people would at the same time protest that coal use is going down, but individually would make very specific choices that would actually lead to the decrease in coal. Um, this is one of the reasons why people would prefer oil, because there's a lot of hard work involved in this. So I'm using my last couple minutes to just go through what would such a perspective on deindustrialization do to our approaches to both the study of energy transition but also deindustrialization. Now the first one is, as I mentioned, it actually brings in women, non-unionized workers. If you think about the rural region as an entire integral energy system, you can really understand how the production does not only rely on paid work, it also relies on all the unpaid work that facilitates some of this. Secondly, for energy historians, we, we tend to always look at those histories and energy transitions by focusing in on one particular energy carrier and often forget about muscle power. And so one of the things that a lot of uh, energy historians now highlight is, of course, the parallel existence of both what we would consider sort of a, 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 a pre-modern and a modern energy system. And as we can see from this, we have something that is belonging to the mineral regime, but it is really essentially created through the work of uh, muscle power of these. So that's another way that we can get at it. Thirdly is, of course, the idea of consumption and, and production. Oftentimes, energy historians are really split along. Either you study energy production or you study energy consumption. Using this idea of revisiting deindustrialization as energy transition really allows us to bring the two together. And it's very significant for this particular topic because a lot of consumption goods are petroleum based. If you think about it, the materiality makes a difference here. So um, we do know that you know, in the early 1960s, more than 30% of German households have washing machines, have TVs, have even cars. And then again, it, it, it particularly um, increases in the rural region because a lot of the miners who are laid off, they're not, partic they're not actually laid off. They're just put into other coal mines. The distance traveling there is much uh, longer. And so very often they start buying cars, also because it is such a symbol of West German wealth. The worker having a car is really indicating that German workers have made it, particularly also in the, world, in the uh, Cold War setting. Because things like this did not go off, this is actually an attempt by the Wokula AG to advertise for a coal burning heater, heater, which looks very modern, was wonderful clean at the time, but I can assure you that did not really sway people to change back um, to coal there. Um, it also allows us, of course, to revisit our discussions around deindustrialization and environmental impact. So rather than um, looking very limited in a limited way to the literature that tries to look at um, toxic legacies and all these things, we can also start talking about energy sacrifice zones. In what way are these particular regions already in themselves 
uh, uh, particularly uh, 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 prone. And it's, I, I don't have the time to go into this picture. It's a very complicated behavior. On the one hand, a lot of these women would really complain about pollution in the region because it would affect their kids. On the other hand, they would, they would be very proud of living in the region and, of course, oh, protesting the closing of mines. So again, we see that kind of ambiguity. The last point is that I've just talked about the German context. And one of the things that I have researched before and that I will do while I'm here doing it in a European context is, unfortunately, in both deindustrialization and energy transition, the competition is national. I can tell you from the sources, all attempts by organized miners to come together with other miners and other regions of the world, here, of course, the United States, did go nowhere. When you are at crisis, things become national. And so this is where energy transitions and deindustrializations are very particular. And the last point is, by bringing in other coal regions, and I'm contrasting here Appalachia with the rural region, the question is also one that we have to ask ourselves about energy transitions. Um, you know, where is the money to actually ease that transition? Where isn't the money to ease that transition? How willing are national governments, but even more so, how willing is organized labor to really work together across national boundaries to address the impact of the next energy transition? So um, to conclude here, what I'm proposing uh, is to remind ourselves that the history of the rural region is deeply embedded in an overarching hydrocarbon-based energy system, which was undergoing significant changes after 1945. And what deindustrialization does very well, focusing on the politics, um, on the other hand, energy transitions doesn't do well, uh, which is focusing on um, the politics. If we bring the two together, it, allow, it allows us to talk about these transitions in a much broader way and including the politics, the social dimension, the cultural and the economic dimension. This is the idea here. So the Strukturwandel in itself is of course a post-1945 phenomenon and really for me constitutes an important regional sub-story in the Great Acceleration and one that should be studied as such and not just and only exclusively from a labor history vantage point. And finally, the lived experience really highlights the ambiguity and ambivalence of human behavior in, a change, in changing energy systems. That that is something where, fortunately for the rural, we have a wonderful source base that is already there, because also I'm very um, resistant to constantly creating new oral histories, which really ha is, is highly problematic in going out there. Um, but it allows us to revisit something that we think we have studied ad absurdum, um, but we can actually really tease out new things that are very important for our current discussions. Thank you very much.